Hello, everybody. This is Don Means, uh, your host today for the seventh uh, in a series uh, around the question of what is a library if the building is closed? Uh, we're doing this as a response effort to the, to the pandemic uh, and the challenges that come from trying to figure out how uh, institutions, specifically libraries, can operate when when they're, they're they're not open, or at least their building is not open. Um, the, we've had, I think today we'll have 22 total speakers and roughly a thousand people register for these sessions since uh, the first one was March the 26th. So just a month now. Today is part of. Uh, National Library Week in the U.S., so we'll we'll dedicate today's Zoom session to libraries everywhere, uh, even uh, even if they're not aware it's National Library Week wherever they are. Uh, it, it should be Library Week every week. Uh, so uh, thanks for making it. Uh, let me. There we go. So these are uh, four areas that we have touched on or sort of aspects of this question, internet access, digital services, physical materials, and as a result of a presentation from uh, a library in Greater Copenhagen uh, about the, the role of libraries as the, uh, the hub, of the, kind of the social hub of, of a community, we added this fourth element and of course should have thought about it in the first place. It's not to say these are the only aspects of this question, but they help us kind of think about it. And we've done uh, targeted sessions around each of these and we keep returning to these themes as, even as we go on. Uh, our, our kind of binding point, or the case that we make here is that, that assuring access to public information is an essential service. As we talk about what's essential and what's not essential these days, being able to uh, acquire current information about the, the pandemic, where you are, what is going on generally is, is critical to people's well-being. And, and that's a job, assuring that access, providing that access, it is what libraries do and, and do better than anyone else. It's a, it's a great responsibility and, and they live up to it. This is our organization. It's an open kind of ad hoc affiliation of, of libraries doing interesting things around technology uh, and in the, in the service of various uh, objectives that are, that are comprehensive and common as libraries are to, uh, to, to community needs. Uh, our own orientation is how to ex principally has been how to extend access to this uh, uh, important library service of, of internet and mainly that's through Wi-Fi uh, and it's it's a stunning number uh, I've, I've mentioned this before in sessions but that roughly one in three adults accesses the internet at a library in the US uh, that's about 80 million people. This is a lot of people. Uh, and, and, you know, not all of them solely depend on the library for, for internet access, but many do. And uh, now, uh, you know, but they've, they've had to go to actually one of the 16 something thousand facilities to access that service. And they've had, and a large number of them have been able to go inside and access the, uh, uh, the, the the machines and the connections inside the building. Now, as we've seen, the the only way to access library Wi-Fi is from outside of the building. Around the building has been the uh, trend as libraries have or, reoriented their their Wi-Fi signals out the building, uh, and even further, as we've talked about earlier, ways to extend that signal wirelessly farther out into the community. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that maybe later, but for now we will uh, get to our program, which is uh, uh, packed with great speakers. Thank you all for coming. 
I don't know if Crosby's joined us yet, uh, but we're going to start today with uh, Hayward, Hayward, Hayward Siwa. Is that right? Did I say it right? Anyway, Hayford is executive director of the Ghana Library Authority and uh, uh, has, uh, has been in that position for the past three years and to lead the first public library service institution in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, his mandate is to establish, equip, manage, and maintain public libraries in Ghana. Uh, if, if you haven't checked your geography, Ghana is in the, in the Bight of Africa, just where, where there's a, a kind of a southern coast, uh, just above Central Africa, just above Equatorial Africa and a really fascinating country. There's a lot going on there. They're, they're embracing technology and we're lucky to have uh, Hayford with us today. So, uh, Hayford, you're, you're on. Let me stop this screen share. All right, thank you very much, uh, Don, and it's a pleasure to speak and share what we are doing in Ghana uh, with you all. Uh, as uh, Don mentioned, uh, uh, the Ghana uh, Library Authority is uh, the first uh, uh, probably public library uh, institution in sub-Saharan Africa and it dates back to uh, uh, 1950 when it was officially uh, outdoored by an act of the Parliament of the Republic of Ghana and so this is one of the institutions that was formed uh, before Ghana gained its independence in 1950 and so even within Ghana, we are the second oldest incorporated institution by an, by an act of the Parliament of Ghana. You may refer to it as the Congress of the, of the U.S., but this is the Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. We are the second oldest incorporated institution. And so it has quite a rich history when it comes to delivering learning. But to put uh, some bit of context, to the role of uh, the Ghana Library Authority. The institution works under the Ministry of Education. And uh, so in other jurisdictions, you may have the public library being under the Ministry of Culture. Uh, and in Ghana, it works uh, under the Ministry of Education. What it means is, is that our core work within uh, the public library space is to support, uh, uh, achieve some sort of learning outcomes or support uh, uh, continuity in learning and promotion of lifelong learning. And so learning, it's, uh, learning in its varied you know, kind of uh, forms. The library authority as of today have 601 staff. Uh, we have 74 branches. I remember last week Ramin was mentioned 61. So since I took over uh, in January 2018, we've managed to increase the number of public libraries under the management of the authority to 74. But we are nowhere even to half of, 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 of the uh, district uh, of this country. Uh, we have 270 districts. And so if you have only 74 public libraries taking care of that, you are really uh, still a bit far behind. And so which means that in the next 10 years, if you look at the education strategic plan of, of, of the country, which is uh, from 2018 to 2030, we are supposed to make sure that we have a footprint in every district of the country. And so in the next couple of years, we should see a really huge expansion in library services uh, in this country uh, as part of effort to promote quality education and support lifelong uh, learning in Ghana. And so one may ask, you know, for many years uh, since the 1950s, the operations of the Ghana Library Authority has been within its brick and mortar environment. And so, uh, uh, so if this uh, pandemic had happened five years ago, nothing would have been happening at the library and all our facilities would have been shut and everybody would have been uh, will have been home. But um, uh, when I took over in 2018, uh, through a policy direction of the government, uh, we decided to outdoor, uh, uh, start to develop a digital library. So what I mean by a digital library is that we decided to recruit software engineers to work in the library. 
And so these software engineers working with the public, with Ghana Library Authority, developed our own app. And so uh, if, uh, I don't know of any other public library in West Africa that has its own app, but if you go on, uh, I mean, if you are within Ghana, you can actually have access to a Ghana Library app on both your uh, Apple phone and your uh, Android-based uh, platform phones. And so uh, since last year, we've been working with different vendors to be able to connect to various resources that are available. And so we've been doing that. However, this COVID period has necessitated uh, the need for us to expand even the range of content that we have, because now, uh, in the past, it was more like, you know, supplementary reading materials being put on there. Uh, to be assessed by various uh, groups of people. But now, because kids are at home uh, and we are creating a lot of awareness, we are creating a lot of awareness about the existence of the app. And so there has been a huge traffic in downloads of the app for use, you know, for reading uh, in various homes across uh, the country. And so for the library authority, uh, this has been a major way for us to continue to de uh, deliver information services. And we've been on radio, we've been on local TV stations to be able to make sure that we connect Ghanaians to the knowledge resources uh, at our disposal. And we've been doing that to engage the Ghanaian public within this COVID period. Be so beside the use of the app also, if you, you visit the Ghana Library Authority's website, which is ghanalibrary.org, you'll realize that we've also launched a competition, so a writing challenge. Uh, the idea is to be able to encourage young people while they stay at home to actually optimum, optimize the use of their time by also curating and developing stories about their experiences over this period. And, um, and we've set up a jury a panel of eminent you know, uh, people who have dedicated their time to support uh, uh, the book industry and library services in this country who will be reviewing uh, some of these stories and the idea is to be able to of course give cash prices to the to some of these uh, writers but we are also going to be publishing their works on the Ghana library app so that uh, Ghanaian children will be reading stories also written by other Ghanaian children. And so that's one of the ways that, you know, we are using to be able to engage a lot more young people also uh, during uh, uh, this, this, this period. And I must say that we actually did a digital launch. Uh, so or if you go through our Facebook, uh, our Facebook, you will notice that we did a Maybe we lost tapered. Yeah. Seems like it. Well, that's a uh, good example of, of the internet and its uh, reliability or lack thereof. I expect he'll try to log back in here in a minute. Uh, it's a, we got the question uh, about home access in Ghana. A uh, question we'll try to put to him. Uh, Hayford, are you back? We see a frozen screen and we don't hear you. So, hope you can get back on. Uh, I think he's just logging off and logging back on again. Yeah, yeah. We'll give him, we'll give him a moment. Um, Ghana is uh, one of the few countries in Africa that's adopted more update uh, spectrum policies, <clears throat> uh, like in the use of uh, TV band for data communications. I think there are only one of two or three countries in the, on the continent that have that have done that. Uh, it's a fairly it's a comparatively higher uh, economic level than than a lot of the countries and there's a certain amount of technology uh, being developed there. So maybe Hayford's having a, a connection problem. Uh, well, let's, let's move on, we'll, we'll circle back and, and uh, let him finish and ask him some questions if he can get back on. So uh, in the meantime, we'll just keep on with our schedule and next up 
is uh, Crosby Kemper, the director of IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, uh, where Crosby has been the director now for, well, almost, for almost exactly four months, I think, something like that. He was confirmed. Less uh, than 90 days, Don. <laughs> he's counting the hours almost. Uh, oh. he, he was just confirmed in January by the Senate and, of course, appointed by the president as the agency reports directly. And uh, uh, before that, Crosby was the director uh, of the Kansas City Public Library for some 15 years. Uh, uh, he is the uh, third chairman of the Shelby Coalition. Uh, Hello. Jenny Stapp, the Montana uh, State Librarian, and myself uh, uh, before that. And, and that uh, he says, God has revealed her sense of humor by appointing him the IMLS director in the middle of a global pandemic. Well, maybe it's humor, but it, I think it's also to, uh, to, our, to our good fortune and to libraries everywhere to have uh, a librarian at the, at the head of the institute and one with a, a, a wide range of experience that Crosby does. I've posted all the bios at the top of the chat. If you haven't uh, had a chance to look at those, click on them and you'll learn a lot about some really interesting people. So uh, welcome Crosby, thanks for taking the time. Good to see you again. Hey Don, good to see you. Um, can I point out, I think Hayford's back on. If you uh, want to, if you want to go okay. back to him, I heard him. I heard him briefly. Thanks. Yeah, Hayford, are you are you there? Hayford, you can talk now. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Camera. Uh, Your camera. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. We can't see you. Okay. Hey, you like my hat? You want to see? Me? Yeah, I like your. Oh, okay. Much better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. I think the internet went on, so I have to shift uh, to use okay. my phone there. All okay. right. Uh, so, Wrap so, this up, paper, and we'll come back with some questions. All right, that's fine. And so, um, I don't know where I got to that the line got cut off, but I was talking about the National Short Story Writing Challenge, which we did a digital launch of it. I believe that message got across. Yes. Okay, and so the other thing that I was describing uh, was the fact that uh, the Ghana Library Authority, you know, one of the key things that we do, uh, of course, is to connect Ghanaian knowledge resources. And doing that, uh, currently, when the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, started uh, its spread in Ghana, on the 15th of March, all public places were called to shut down. Uh, there was a lockdown for a period of three weeks, which was lifted over, uh, which was lifted some few days ago. And so, uh, one of the responsibilities that was tasked with the Ministry of Education, for which the Ghana Library Authority is under, was to be able to have uh, learning content delivered through radio, television, and online. And Ghana Library Authority is working with the Ghana Education Service to deliver that. And so uh, currently we've launched a, a channel, a TV channel called the Ghana Learning TV, which is uh, available 24 seven. Uh, Ghana Library Authority is playing a critical role in organizing content and making sure that uh, the resources that are required to be broadcast on this platform uh, is made uh, available on that. Uh, we're working with uh, Ghana, uh, Ghana Education Service and the Ministry of Education currently to develop content for um, right from kindergarten to um, uh, uh, junior high schools. And so we're developing content for radio and content also for online. And currently, as I speak to you, our developers are working around the clock to come up with a nationwide learning management system, which will have uh, a synchronization with our digital library and support teachers to be able to uh, deliver uh, lessons uh, through uh, through the internet. And so, uh, so beside you know the TV and the radio, there's going to be an online man uh, learning management system to be able to support that. And the library authority is leading uh, on that particular project to be able to get this. Uh, 
are available to Ghanaian teachers so that they can support uh, 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 learning. And so what it means is that the library authority is responsible for provision of training. So ongoing training, you know, for teachers across the country are going to remotely be organized by uh, the team at the Ghana Library. So we have been working in that space, but then, you know, also when COVID came in, we also decided to create a lot of animations and videos to create awareness about the dangers of this particular disease and how people can take care of themselves. And hey, so- that's, that's brilliant. That's, that's, that's really amazing to do, uh, to use all media for uh, broadcast of the content you're creating. Uh, we have some questions for you. Uh, I appreciate that. But I think we'll try to do our questions uh, as a group at the end, if you can come back. And so we can move on through the program right now. There was a question about uh, the, the level of internet access at home in Ghana. So think about that one a little bit and we'll come back. Uh, we'll come back to you at, at the question uh, session. And so for now, we'll, we'll move on uh, and have Crosby pick it up again. Crosby, you're on. Great. Am I uh, unmuted now? Am I? Can you hear me? You're unmuted, and you're almost. I, I'm, al I'm all. I'm almost always unmuted. I have to uh, say, as you know, Don. Uh, Don. Don and I go back a long, long way. We've been we've been friends for a long, a long time, and I've learned everything I know from Don. Uh, yeah. And and therefore, there are many lawsuits. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Institute of Museum and Library Services and what we're doing in the, uh, the current uh, pandemic and, and what our role is uh, for libraries and museums, particularly at the moment uh, around the question of reopening, uh, get, uh, of our, uh, getting our uh, services and our place in the, the intellectual, the cultural and community life uh, of the United States uh, back to some semblance of normal, the new normal anyway. Uh, so the, uh, the Institute is the primary United States government agency uh, uh, with respect to museums and libraries. Uh, we have funding, uh, grant funding for museums and libraries uh, available uh, out of every recent uh, United States budget. Um, there's some challenges to that. Uh, we're not always prioritized uh, in initial budgets, uh, budget discussions, and uh, but usually there are friends inside the administration and, uh, and and on both sides of the aisle in Congress that uh, that uh, support uh, our mission. And uh, we have a budget of a little around 250 million dollars to which was added $50 million in the, uh, the last, not, not the current, not the one that would just passed yesterday, but the, the previous uh, uh, CARES Act uh, response to the coronavirus. Uh, we got $50 million and we are in the process of getting our, we have grant, uh, we've got $30 million of that out the door uh, to state libraries in the United States and we are working on our grant guidelines for the for the 20 million dollars that's left and that should be out very soon uh, next week. Uh, we designed those and Congress uh, with its language helped us uh, design those with more flexibility than our usual grant programs um, uh, focused more on the overall community impact uh, and including and, and encouraging, which has confused them, I have to say, my fault, uh, libraries and museums to collaborate more. So $30 million available to uh, state libraries and the $20 million for, for a wide variety of programs uh, could be uh, open to, uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, more groups uh, and more group activities, community activities. Uh, the focus within all of this is on digital enablement, particularly with regard to the digital divide, particularly with regard to having an effect in uh, challenged environments, digital deserts, uh, the high poverty areas and rural uh, small town areas that are, that are significantly underserved, significantly underconnected. Um, it's our view, Congress's view, the administration's view, uh, that the digital divide is 
particularly uh, a problem uh, in the current environment where everyone is accessing information from home uh, and conducting their lives significantly on the internet as we are right now. Uh, and so we, we have focused our grant making not only with the $50 million we got, which is simply 20% more than our, our usual annual budget. It's a topping off of our annual budget, uh, and not, a, not, a, not a very significant amount of budget. It's important, but uh, it's not large. Um, and, but we're also repurposing our existing money to the extent that we can to directly address the community impact of the uh, virus. The other thing that's happening inside the agency and inside the library and museum world, a result of our, our attempting to provide information to, to, the, to the library world initially and also the museum world, we, we had a webinar with the CDC uh, about uh, a little over two weeks ago. Uh, and there were a lot of specific questions about things like materials, about books, for instance, particularly books, uh, and the virus relationship to books. And the CDC uh, gave us great information in general, uh, but the specifics of the library world and the museum world were developing, let's say, and we recognize that. Uh, Smithsonian then did, a few days after that, did a webinar that we participated in uh, with Johns Hopkins folks. Uh, and a similar thing happened mainly on the subject of reopening, which was a question in the previous uh, webinar as well. And we realized that there is a lot of information out there, not terribly specific or when specific, not precisely fact or science-based. So we decided to create uh, a, a, a project around this and we have uh, issued a press release and signed an MOU with Battelle, the science uh, research organization in Columbus, Ohio, to do research on materials that are specific to libraries and museums. And we already have given them uh, a parcel of materials, uh, books, DVDs, CDs, and other things uh, from uh, from the Columbus Library. Uh, and we are uh, we have a steering committee of museum and library people that is uh, considering further materials uh, to send to Battelle uh, to do specific research. They have the virus in their laboratories. They already have a relationship uh, with the federal government uh, through Health and Human Services and other, other parts of the government. Uh, so they, they're at work. They are now at work on that. And we have, as part of the cooperative agreement, uh, we have uh, also developed a relationship with the OCLC. Uh, in order to share this information, to create on their website, to be determined in the next few days, uh, uh, a, a site to collect as much information as we can to outline best practices and protocols uh, around uh, the information that develops from the materials and that is being developed in many places uh, around uh, uh, staff, patron, public space, interactions, social distancing, testing, uh, the, the wide variety of things that we have to, to consider to successfully reopen libraries and museums. And we recognize we're doing this on the fly as reopenings are being considered and in and, and specific places our protocols are being developed. Um, and we'll share that to the extent that we uh, can. And, uh, and, and as I say, uh, round up the, the best ideas, the best thinking, the best research, um, and, and, and the widest variety of thoughtful contemplation uh, about uh, these issues uh, reopening. We've already had a little bit of an effect on, uh, on this world uh, in that uh, Johns Hopkins, I uh, mentioned before, issued a report last Friday uh, that some of you will have seen uh, about uh, public health uh, in public spaces uh, is oriented towards what uh, the issues that will be confronted in reopening uh, and and the specific thing that they were measuring uh, in the report uh, was contact intensity inside public uh, spaces and the library world felt very strongly that they had misunderstood the usage of uh, library space uh, and a lot of 
librarians and library organizations contacted uh, uh, Johns Hopkins. We we spent some time with them, the authors of the report, uh, uh, pointing out the, the high level of contact intensity in most uh, most libraries, particularly urban libraries, uh, around computers, public programming, uh, and uh, and basic social interaction. And uh, and they've now issued a a, a, a essentially a reorganization of the of their information and their 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 tables of contact in, uh, intensity around that. And the point of, of saying all this is is that to, to reopen successfully, we have to be mindful of I think two uh, uh, competing interests uh, in the in the library world. It's pretty obvious, but I think it's going to be important in the museum world and pretty much all public spaces as well. And that is the safety concern, the safety concern for for staff and patrons uh, uh, and for the general community uh, to help health effects of the general community. And on the other side, the importance of libraries and museums, uh, the essential importance to libraries and museums, not only to the cultural life, the intellectual life of the community, but to the communal life, uh, the, the public life uh, of the community, to so many community organizations, uh, to, to uh, so many ways of uh, gathering uh, public, uh, so many ways of enlightening and providing refuge uh, to, to the uh, to the public, and uh, so we're we're engaged in that uh, today. Uh, we have a, a great steering committee from a number of major uh, associations and institutions, including the Smithsonian, the National Archives, the Library of Congress, uh, the major associations uh, in the library world, in the uh, the museum world. Uh, and uh, some scientific advice from uh, from uh, institutions and individuals at uh, Yale, UCLA, NYU, etc. And uh, so we're we're underway. Uh, you'll you'll see us, uh, I think, communicate this uh, inside the library and museum worlds and outside to the extent that we can. Uh, there's no ownership that the IMLS has of uh, any of the information or protocols or procedures. They'll be very customized at the local level. A lot of this will be driven, as we know, by public health authorities. And in the United States, uh, public health is a very federal, uh, in the in the uh, pure sense of the word. Uh, some of it comes from the uh, the national government. Some of it comes from state government, and a lot of it uh, is is at the local level. Um, and reopening of public spaces will be very much driven by public health authorities at the local level. And we'll try to round up that information as it comes in uh, and display it, recognizing that everyone's going to have to make decisions, uh, customized decisions in their, their local universe. And uh, so that, that's the, 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 my essential message for, for today in, inside the coronavirus. I do. I do want to say that the IMLS is uh, very, very focused on uh, the importance of good information uh, in a time like this. And uh, libraries have always been a place, uh, and museums, but libraries in particular have always been a place uh, in, in which uh, validated information, uh, reference librarian as a professional uh, uh, has, has provided the, the best uh, information and and that becomes even more important uh, even more essential uh, in the current uh, environment and the healthcare information that we're trying to put, put out now is uh, is the core of that uh, point well made Crosby uh, about uh, curated information and, and trusted sources of information they're just mountains of information flowing in every direction resource pages piling up uh everywhere and people just really are not clear on where the authorities lie there's so many conflicting cross uh, stories and right so and, and John, the library. yeah what, one point i do want to make which probably everybody on this call knows but the science is developing as we speak that the uh 
if you read the front page of the New York Times today, you get one another of a series of articles that are being written in the Times, the Journal of the Washington Post, and elsewhere, of course, uh, uh, about the epidemiology. They studied uh, some, I forget the size of the group, I think it's about 3,000 in the metro area, uh, and, and they've come to the conclusion that 21, and this is one small study, so it's a conclusion, not the conclusion, uh, that 21% of New Yorkers in New York area residents are infected. And there's good news and bad news in this. Bad news is that's a very high infection rate. Good news is, it, if that turns out to be true, and it's one small study, if that turns out to be true, the death rate is actually very low, much lower than we've been, been considering. There are a whole series of studies like this. There's some California studies that say more or less the same thing, um, but it's developing information. The epidemiology of this is not yet clear. And anything, anything we say, protocols and, and best practices, et cetera, have to be uh, understood as uh, attempts uh, to reflect what we know now, knowing that we will know more soon, but we, don't, we won't know everything, probably for a cycle that is at least a year long. Yeah, good point. So it, it means that a lot of the information we're using to make decisions is still tentative. And right. we have to keep that in mind, you know, and it depends on how much risk we're willing to take and what kind of circumstances. And, and appreciated your remarks about opening. I know there's a lot of urge to do that. And, and some libraries have, have not had to fully close, or even if they have closed, they've still been able to deliver materials curbside. And that's a reasonable kind of uh, step, I guess, towards opening. Uh, they're delivering Wi-Fi at the building, or now in the building parking lots. Uh, of course, not everybody right. has a car, but a lot of people do. So step by step, you know, libraries right. have- Step by one. step, and, and it should be said, uh, the discussion in the library world around curbside uh, and, and, and also around the use of Wi-Fi outside the library creates issues around social distancing, what you do with the materials that you're delivering a curbside in terms of disinfection. Uh, and, and then of course, we, we already have the issue of materials coming back to the library, uh, those curbside deliveries, or just simply from, from the material that's already out. And some libraries are deciding to simply quarantine those materials uh, until their notice. Uh, some are adapting. 72 hour uh, yeah. uh, quarantining, that sort of thing. And the, and the science around that is still unclear. And that's the specific material that we're, we're concerned about because it, it's really the surface questions are not clear are books, uh, but there are gonna be other surfaces that are, that, that are equally problematic uh, as we go along. So there are a rise in digital services, uh, and that's another set of, of issues. Uh, so this is all real time, as you say, complex and happening. Crosby, thank you very much for taking the time today. I think you set up a, a perfect segue to uh, a state library uh, in Georgia. That's a state in the U.S., Georgia, uh, that is uh, one of the recipients of these funds you just mentioned flowing out, this $30 million grant. Uh, and we're very lucky to have uh, Julie Walker with us. Julie has uh, been the vice chair and state librarian for about uh, the past year and a half and, and the assistant for uh, four years before that. Uh, so Julie will give us a perspective of kind of how the state libraries are, are, are processing and dealing with uh, this new grant funds in addition to all the other things that they do. And uh, Julie happens to reside in uh, a state that I believe was liberated today, uh, and so has uh, a range of experience, perhaps unique, unique to us. So Julie Walker, welcome, and uh, share with us what, what's going on there in, in, in Georgia, the state of Georgia. Don, thanks so much for having me, and Crosby, thank you so much for those uh, grants to states funds. We are busy in Georgia or how we intend to use those for all of our 408 libraries. Georgia is a large state with 
a vast amount of rural area and some large urban areas. So as the state library, we always have to be thinking about how we can help all of our 408 public libraries. Um, we have always been had taken a lot of pride in our technology and internet services here in Georgia. I think we were one of the first states to have high-speed internet at every single public library. And I think we're still the only state that offers matching funds to completely cover the library's internet service bills after the E-rate um, has been paid. My agency is a unit of the University System of Georgia, which is kind of a unique position for a state library, but one that has a lot of advantages. And in this situation, it made us really aware of the situations of the 333,000 college students in our state who were suddenly mid-March moved to online instruction, as did our K-12 schools, um, because their classes have been canceled through the end of the year and our universities are not even doing uh, in-person camp. Uh, um, so I, I'd just like to quickly talk about a couple of things we've done to address their plight. We've worked with our state legislative agencies for several years on broadband availability issues. Um, and because we have so many rural areas and people who rely on our libraries, we knew how difficult it would be for the students to complete that online coursework. Um, our libraries all agreed to have to keep our Wi-Fi on. Um, to ensure access outside of our buildings. All but a handful have no password needed. All the ones who do require a password have that on signage and on their websites, but most of them is just uh, wide open internet. And we were able to publish a map just a couple of days after the libraries closed to pinpoint every one of those locations. And if you click on the location you're interested in, we also have a link um, to apply for a digital library card. So even people who had not obtained a library card up till that time could do so to access our digital resources as well. Worked with our governor's office, the Georgia Technology Authority, and the Department of Community Affairs on a more comprehensive map of all Wi-Fi locations, not just libraries, but other ones around the state and contributed to that as well. And we've really worked to publicize both of those maps through social media, newspaper and television interviews, through the faculty and staff of the universities, um, so that everyone would be aware that this is a service that's available throughout Georgia, especially in those rural areas where you don't have McDonald's and you don't have Starbucks and there really is nowhere uh, to access the internet. And so many people still can't get internet access at home. We have, ask the libraries to post signs reminding users to observe social distancing and our state map actually has a warning that you have to an agreement before you can even view the map um, that verifies that you'll follow social distance protocols the next thing we looked at were these students who again were required to complete online coursework and were trying to do it on their phones because they did not actually own a device and because they were away from their campuses had no device available to do this coursework. Several of our libraries were already engaged in lending out uh, Chromebook laptops um, through ordinary library service. So we contacted those libraries and asked them if they were willing to figure out a way to continue to get those laptops in the hands of students who needed them. They all immediately enthusiastically agreed that they would figure that out. So we scrambled to find every Chromebook that we could possibly purchase with, with the money we still had left um, because supply is really low around the country, but we were able to purchase 250 additional Chromebooks, get them in the hands of the same library. Then connections between the university students who were needing a device and their nearest public library to do a safe handoff outside the building of that Chromebook. Uh, they're allowed to keep it through the end of the semester if they need it through summer semester, they'll be allowed to keep it through that as well. Um, that has been incredibly well received. The professors and the university administrators and the students are absolutely delighted that we have been able to fill that gap for students. We, we plan to open this up to um, high school students next week as well as our supply. 
um, runs, and we actually had a front page um, story in the Atlanta Journal Constitution about the first student who got it and who said the library saved our lives. I'll just mention a couple of statistics right quick because we have been closed for just about 30 days and libraries to give me some idea of how that Wi-Fi use was going along. We in 23 of our systems, we had over 45,000 uses and I was particularly struck by one of our poor counties with only 1,700 residents had 450 uses of their Wi-Fi in 30 days. So that tells us we're really meeting a need um, that is out there. One final thing that I'll mention is that we asked a group of our library directors who uh, represent the entire team of library directors to work on a document that would detail some best practices for reopening because said, and as I'm sure you've all read, our governor is starting to reopen uh, Georgia businesses today. The selected list of types of businesses that will open today or are allowed today, including salons, um, bowling alleys, gym, and then Monday restaurants are allowed to reopen. So definitely that is encouraging cities and counties to start contacting their library directors to talk about reopening. At this moment, I think the earliest reopening date that any library is planning here in Georgia is May 11th, but that's just around the corner. So we have published the work of a group of library directors um, on some best practices and considerations around reopening, and I'll be happy to put that link in the chat. They did an exceptional job, a tremendous amount of research, really looking at the most authoritative sources on these topics that, as Crosby said, are just changing so rapidly right now. But I think this is a really good guide. I'll be happy to share that. I'll also put in the link to our Library Everywhere resources that shows our Wi-Fi map, as well as a lot of the virtual and digital resources that our libraries are offering right now. So, um, terribly, terribly proud of the work that our libraries have done. They are eager to get back to work, but want to do that in a way that is safe for both their staff and their patrons. But we feel like we certainly are meeting some needs that we've identified right now. That's great, Julie. Uh, and, and you just help us remember how important it is, especially right now, the, the services at the state level. Uh, we talk about you know these multi-levels of government, uh, local governments are effectively subsidiaries of state government. They're chartered, They're, uh, they are the state government, whereas the states are not subsidiaries of the federal government and are able to do, as we see, many take many different approaches. That's been a strength and a weakness, of course, for, for the history of the country. But uh, the, the role of the state libraries right now just could not be more in focus. And it's not just as a, a conduit for these funds, but leadership on on practices and information and you know thank you for all you do uh, we're uh, we're starting to run a little short on the time we'll hopefully we'll come back for some questions I've got a couple but I uh, will hold those uh, we will uh, uh, we will stop the recording on the hour but we'll stay on and we can keep a conversation going it just won't be a recorded part uh, we'll summarize the chat and the, and the presentation today. And we'll post those tomorrow. I say we, that's our, our host, uh, the International Federation of Library Associations, uh, with Stephen Weiber on right now uh, and at the control room in the Netherlands running this uh, Zoom. Uh, our, our other host is the Internet Society and the Partnership for Public Access. Uh, those are not linked in the chat, but you know, they will be. Uh, so uh, Stephen will introduce our, our final speaker today and uh, himself as well. So Stephen. Thank you, Julie. So thank you, Don, for the introduction and, and thank you to Julie and Cosby and Hayford for their intervention so far. I'll keep this short um, and hand over to Raphael Batz, who is in charge of international relations at one of the two main French library schools, NCIB, 
she is incredibly, extremely well involved in work around library advocacy and promoting the connection that the impact that libraries can have on development. And she's also led in setting up a heavily oversubscribed uh, chat among French libraries on how to respond and how they're coping with COVID. So I'll hand over to Raphael. Hello, I hope you can hear me. Um, and uh, first of all, thank you for this invitation. And I, I apologize for my English. So I hope you can hear me and that I will be understood. So I, I would like to, to share with you uh, something we are doing in France and with the French speaking uh, uh, librarians. Uh, so in my school, I'm from NC, which is the National School for Librarians in France. Uh, we, we were facing, as you know, the COVID situation. Uh, we were very concerned with the needs of librarians for a collective discussion about uh, the situation, confinement, and also the after the reopening. And we were thinking it's um, a perfect time for thinking the libraries. And uh, in that context, uh, our school was also asking what could be useful for the professional community that NC can provide. Because the universities are useful for librarians even when uh, our training and uh, resources are maybe not as accessible as used to. So um, there was this concept and uh, my school decided to uh, open our resources and to open the, uh, some uh, online classes for librarians to take a chance to um, improve their, uh, their profession uh, exercise uh, during this time. And uh, as the researcher in that school, I, I had uh, this, uh, this, uh, this concern, this injunction, and in the same time, I'm working about um, uh, the political role of uh, libraries and uh, the social role of libraries. And uh, uh, I finished my PhD six months ago, and I was fighting for saying that the libraries are so useful, so useful, and, and then the COVID. And, um, at this moment when the library closed and uh, there was a discussion in France about uh, what uh, is essential in the, in the, in the society and uh, the state, the, the government and the people were talking about uh, bookshop and not about libraries and they are talking about a lot of space like, I don't know, coffee, a place, and things like that, and not about libraries. And so I had this question, are, are we really useful, and uh, are we really useful during this confinement? So um, as a researcher, and as a librarian, and as a um, teacher in librarianship, um, I proposed to my school to open um, a seminar, a webinar about uh, what is uh, the role of libraries during the the COVID. So, what what was the what was the how? Yeah, the project was to have an online research webinar with ten topics, uh, services, spaces, um, social media, things like that. And uh, each uh, session begin with an introduction, and then a workshop. And the first meeting was the 31st of March. Uh, I was expecting 75 people. I was thinking it was great if 75 librarians could join me uh, and that we could have this collective discussion all together. But the reality is that we had 1,600 people who registered to the webinar. 1,000, sorry, 1,600 people, 1,600. And so we made, <laughs> implode the, the server and uh, the platform doesn't, uh, doesn't succeed to follow the, all the registration at the same time. So we had to change the way to, to, to work. So um, finally, uh, we organized, um, so the 
who organized uh, me as a researcher. So finally, I I, um, I found a team of animators. I found 34 librarians very involved, it's librarians, teachers, students uh, from France or Belgium. They were um, okay to uh, make the animation of the workshop with me. We had a technical team, three librarians from one library, which is uh, close in this moment. Uh, this is digital librarians, in fact, and the librarian team from my school to make a libguide. So we had uh, 1,600 registration, 55 uh, countries, uh, all French-speaking people, 90% uh, French people. So the research webinar is a uh, is research webinar. But so the idea is to take the confinement and the COVID as an opportunity to rethink the way we are designing adapted services to a specific situation. And, and in the moment, in this moment, the situation is uh, of course a confinement and COVID and pandemia, etc. Uh, each session begins with an introduction to the concept of the session's topic. And then we have a workshop with questions and exercises where people are working all together. Uh, and we are producing some resources, video, text, summaries, a lib guide, and so on. Uh, so the first one was about uh, services. And the idea was to say that in this moment, or at the beginning of the confinement, when this is when the library were closed, the first uh, the reaction was to say what we can do I have this service how I can give it to the public when we are confined so it gives situation like we have these services usually we can do it on digital way and I was uh, proposing to my colleague that to stop that and to just think what people need in this moment and we had a big discussion and you can find the summary of the session we have translated it so i can send it to you um, we had a, a strong work about the need of the people and to think that maybe we need to develop and to design new services adapted to this situation so the needs that we found was uh, first the need for social connection a need to have fun and keep busy a need to feel useful and to create community a need to reassure oneself and manage uncertainty uh, daily life, a need to achieve projects, like for example, the students, they need to finish their studies, a need to deal with confinement from the point of view of your confined body, this is very important, and the need for recognition for all the people who are on the first uh, front line. Uh, so with all the needs we dis we find some uh, issues and challenges for the libraries and uh, some example of things that we can do and uh, the second meeting was about spaces so the the conceptual approach was to say that um, we have to think about what is a, a public space and to understand that in a public space there is uh, yes the, the public aspect the circulation of people and um, and books and objects, but there is also a lot of constraints. And uh, the, the question is uh, how the library, when it will be reopened, uh, will deal with this aspect of uh, maybe an increasement of uh, the constraints and uh, how to stay a public space like this. The second point was also about routines and rhythm. Uh, in the confinement, we have a change of routines. Uh, we are working from home, we are changing the way uh, uh, to dress and I don't know, things like that. We have to take care of kids and so on. We can go out, etc. So uh, the change of routines and how the library can uh, get in these new routines. And the last point was about hospitality. Uh, the libraries are hospitality hospitality place they are income welcoming the people and uh, we work on what uh, is hospitality for library and more what could be the digital hospitality when finally we are uh, inviting people to join us on a digital space and uh, last point we work about after confinement with the reopening what to do so we had a lot of uh, proposition and concern about after confinement so librarians work on these three um, 
blocks of uh, discussion, routine and rhythm, uh, digital hospitality, and after confinement, and they uh, find some uh, um, description, issues, um, breakdowns, facilitators, uh, and uh, proposition. Yeah. Uh, to define what uh, the library can do now and what the library can do after that. But about after confinement and reopening, um, I, I would like to share that uh, librarians find uh, uh, express three concerns. The first one is about the conditions uh, for the teams, how how will be the condition and sanitary condition and so on. Uh, the second one is uh, a concern about liberty and, and access to public space. So I give you an oh, example. I give, I give you an example. So um, in France, we are talking about uh, application for uh, knowing people who are sick or what. Um, and uh, what will be in the library? Do we have to check if people are sick before coming into the library, before giving back the books and things like that. So we, we are very concerned with this kind of question. And the last point is about uh, the future of uh, libraries because uh, for now it's a safe, before it was a safe place and also a social place, but when we will reopen, how to keep the library as a safe place, how to keep the library as a social place. So librarians work a lot on this with a lot of proposition about uh, three time for anticipation uh, on a short term, how to reopen, on a middle term, uh, how to continue with the budget, with the teams, are we going to lose some um, uh, positions, some jobs, things like that, and on the long term, how to reorganize this team to not be surprised the next time because we are thinking that uh, uh, confinement is now, but maybe we will have confinement in three months or six months or I don't know. And uh, we have this problem now, but we will have some other problems with uh, uh, the team change and things like that. So we think that we have to be here. And uh, so we work also on the different transformation of the services of the library in the in the near future and uh, and uh, that was very rich and uh, uh, what, what i want to say next the, the last one was about um uh, the social role of libraries and how to keep uh, to take care of uh, everybody and specifically the people that can have access to internet in this moment or they don't have time or they don't have extra because they don't have the, the condition to have access to what libraries can, can propose. And the work was to uh, not to think about exclusion, but to think about taking care of and uh, with the ethics of care. And uh, we did that yesterday. And so there was uh, 11 uh, workshop running simultaneous, continuously. Uh, on this um, on this uh, topic, the first time about needs and services, we had 900 people working simultaneously. The second time, 500, and yesterday I think between three or 400 people. And because it was yesterday, I have not finished the summary, but it will be done and then translate it in English, and then I can send it to you. And it's not finished because we have 10 topics. So that's it in 10 minutes. Sorry, it's very very. <laughs> Sorry. Very compressed, but thank you, Rafael. Uh, uh, you you bring us back to the beginning point, uh, talking about a place, library's place. It's been it's been the mantra for years now. And you know, what is the place when there's no place, or the place is closed, and and how that recovers, and yet it still is a place, albeit a virtual place, at the moment. Uh, it's actually the theme of the National Library Week in the U.S. is find your place at the library. So, you know, that's a, another challenge. You also help us uh, remember that uh, with you and, and Hayford presenting from Ghana that, you know, this is a, this is a global conversation. There's a global pandemic and we're fortunate to have a global profession of librarians and some 350,000 public libraries around the world who all are more or less dealing with this one way or another in their in their own communities and and areas and so that that represents a 
a kind of a communication and a, and a activity and a sharing platform real time like never before. And I think the librarians are in an in a ideal position to help lead, lead us through this crisis. We're gonna close the recording session right now. I wanna thank everybody. We'll stay on. We have some questions. I hope our speakers can stay on a little longer and we'll carry on this event and we'll be back next Friday with another uh, oh, 430,000, excuse me, uh, public libraries around the world is the latest number. Uh, we'll be back next week and we look forward to you all coming back. Thank you very much, Stephen.